Hello, I hope uh, you are with us now and you already starting watching us. Uh, I welcome all our visitors on our first online uh, lecture, uh, this time as a collaboration uh, with the Festival of Science in Rijeka. And in the future, Center of Innovative Media will continue with uh, inviting uh, special guests uh, to give lectures, sc uh, screenings and uh, information on art and technology. Why experimental film and why Ingo Petzke? Uh, because, uh, first of all, I know Ingo Petzke uh, since many years, and I know that, that he is one of the biggest specialists and, uh, uh, in, the, in the field of uh, experimental film. He started already uh, in 1973 as a very young person, later as a lecturer, professor, doctor uh, of film studies, and he is one of the biggest collectors also on experimental film. And experimental film is for me the beginning of arts and science because many of things that uh, artists did in that time uh, was related also to the certain research and development. So uh, I welcome also our guest Ingo Petzke and I'm looking forward uh, to that we hear uh, his first lecture in our room. So please, Ingo, you are our guest. Yeah, thank you, Ingo Bock. Uh, uh, I'm happy, obviously, to be here, and uh, I'm delighted to be able uh, to show some of the thoughts and some of the films with you. Uh, but do not fear, this won't be an in-depth lecture about the importance of sound. I won't go into any philosophy, and I won't, to, won't tire you with technical uh, thoughts. What I intend to do is a half-decent chronological presentation about how sound in experimental or avant-garde film is treated, or how it was treated on equal footing with the visuals. But be warned, following what Inga just said, experimental film or avant-garde film is art. This is why a lot of uh, filmmakers in that area don't have sound at all. Because they say, you won't find a soundtrack under a Picasso, Picasso or Chagall or whatever painting in a gallery or in a museum. So I don't want to have this. And uh, one of the most uh, uh, famous uh, filmmakers, whom I won't deal he was here otherwise today, Stan Breckage, American. He made roughly 360 films during the run of his life, but only a handful were with sounds. Okay, but let's start. Um, I want to start with uh, Opus 1 by Walter Rotman. Um, the, uh, the premiere of this film was on the 21st of April 1921. It was the first publicly shown abstract film. So pretty much on the day, almost on the day, it's a hundred years now that this film came into public, into the public field and it was known. Opus One uh, by Rotman was uh, uh, definitely the first one. And uh, when you read about Hans Richter and Viking Egeling, forget about it, it's all fake and I don't want to go into here, is a, is a lot of struggling to make oneself more important in art history than it really is. Walter Ruttmann was the first. Uh, Ruttmann, a painter, had moved from expressionism to full-blown abstraction. As early as 1917, he argued that filmmakers had become stuck in the wrong direction due to their misunderstanding of cinema's essence, which prompted him to use the, technolog the technologically derived form uh, of film or the or medium of film to produce new art, calling for, I quote, a new method of expression, one different from all the other arts, a medium of time, an art meant for our eyes one differing from painting in that it in that it has a temporal dimension, like music and in rendition of a real or stylized moment in an event or fact. 
but rather precisely in the temporal rhythm of visual events. So let's look at it. It's probably the longest one you're going to see, but I think because it's the first one, we have to do it. It's uh, 11 minutes. It is a silent film. Sorry, I'm switching off the later soundtrack that they put on it.
Well, as I didn't uh, show you the soundtrack, which I didn't don't really like, it's a, a, a silent film. We don't have to talk much about that. You have uh, noticed that it's a uh, film in color. Obviously, in those days, we didn't have color film, not in the way that we know it today. There were two techniques which they used, tinting or toning. Uh, but this one was uh, uh, later made its a restoration by the Film Museum Munich. The, the interesting part is, uh, the really interesting part is that uh, when we talk about visual music, and we have to talk about visual music at this point, because we still were in the area of silent film. We couldn't accompany f uh, music to films. And the interesting point is, if we look at these early films, they all have musical terms for their titles. Uh, Walter Rottmann made uh, uh, Opus 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, Hans Richter named his films Rhythm 21 and Rhythm 23 and Rhythm 25. And uh, Viking Egerling, the Swede, uh, called his Diagonal Symphony. These are all musical terms. And what they were trying to do is, <coughs> sorry, uh, recreating or, or doing the film, making the film in a sense that it was music, it was music for the eye. Uh, there are different ways in which we can do this, uh, but one of the, the uh, uh, valid uh, definitions is that uh, visual music is a dynamic art form which combines visual and musical material in a way that it acts together and a joint effect is reached, which alone has, could not have been reached, or mathematically said, one plus one is three. Both together make something new. And uh, very, very similar, the American filmmaker Shirley Clark said, visual music is the visual, visual extension of sound. If sound and image work together. Hopefully, both media transcend into something new, a new third medium. So that's that's the important part of it. We, we come back to part of this later. It's interesting to note, even though the, the first sound film, the feature in, in feature film that we know of, uh, The Jazz Singer by, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, by Alan Crossland, 1928 in the United States is considered the first sound film. But the, 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 the patent for uh, optical sound uh, was given in already in 1919, the tree ergon, uh, and it was uh, discovered or, or uh, developed by three uh, engineers then working in Germany, jo Josef Engel, Josef Masola, and Hans Vogt. And basically, <coughs> I'm really sorry. Basically, what uh, optical sound does, it's it's that uh, uh, photoelectric cells uh, transfer or, or uh, yeah transform sound waves into electric impulses, and vice versa. So that's the, if you've seen a film strip, which you probably don't see these days much of. There's always these little things on the side where the sound is. Um, and actually since 1922, three years later, they have been doing, uh, these people together with artists as well, they have been doing uh, experiments what we could do with sound. And uh, Walter Ottmann was among them. And in 1930, he made a film that's pretty funny for us. It's a film that ran in the cinemas and I'll show it to you. It's called Weekend. Don't think it's wrong. It's completely black. There is no image to it.
So have you, as you have heard, this is a pretty radical thing, uh, considering <coughs> that uh, you had to sit in a, in a cinema to hear this, and what we hear is pretty clear. I mean, working in a shop, working in a factory, 
then it's the weekend, they go out into the countryside, they do some hiking, they go to a pub and having an eat, and then they return by bus to the city, and then the next morning it's the alarm clock. It, it's nothing uh, special, but imagine this had to be shown, screened in the cinema, because there was no radio at the time. And they couldn't do it any otherwise. And the people, they were so hungry for real sounds, for the reality that they went and listened to this and then had their own ideas, their own visuals coming up probably in their mind. Very different is the next film, and we're coming now uh, to shorter films, Oscar Fischinger. Oscar Fischinger was a jack of all trades in uh, German film, animation film, and whatever. He started 1925 with a series of films which he called Studies. It went on to study number 14, and uh, they were all uh, related to music. That's why he called them studies. And uh, uh, since study number six, he could really synchronize them to sound. I show you one which I like the most. It's a study number seven, because this in already includes a three-dimensional approach to the, to the screen not only two-dimensional as before. So what you've heard here is uh, uh, the Hungarian dance by Brahms, which was the soundtrack. Um, the, the images, the visuals look very clear and crispy. And uh, this is because uh, two and a half minutes, this film, uh, Fischinger needed 5,000 drawings for this film because he was really drawing each frame and not like which, and did not what it's uh, the normal thing in an animation film that only each fourth frame is really uh, uh, drawn and the rest are just in betweens. But the more interesting question, the context of what, what I'm going to show you here today is uh, that he already made music films before sound films were in existence. And uh, obviously this 
caused major problems and he had to make sure that the film ran in sync with the music. Otherwise, the whole effort would have been in vain. How did he do it? He invented a way of having records play synchronous, synchronous to a film in the cinemas. He divided a, sec, uh, a record uh, into segments, making it look much like a cake from above, just like this. And then, <coughs> this way, he was able, for example, to determine exactly how many segments a beat would last. Knowing the rounds per minute of the record, in those days it was 78, he was able to calculate the exact length of that beat and from there on exactly how many frames of films would be equivalent. He reached a superb perfection this way, long before the possibilities of editing the way we know today. It's, uh, it's very simple, even though it's a lot of calculations, but calculation is not uh, uh, rocket science, exactly. Once uh, the sound film came into existence, obviously people like Fischinger uh, ran into other problems uh, because the rights to the music, with uh, study number eight, for example, to give you just an example, is he uh, used music and he didn't have the rights to it. Uh, he couldn't uh, buy them. So he thought that uh, one day uh, when he was a bit more affluent with money, he would get back to it and do it, but that never happened. Uh, Fisher did a lot of different things. He went to the United States early on in 1934, but wasn't uh, very successful. Uh, in 1947, he made his last film, Motion Painting Number no. 1. This is based on Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 3 by Johann Sebastian Bach, which he intended to transform into images for a long time. But this time he decided not to edit music in full sync with the image. He was so impoverished that he had to come up with a cheaper way. And uh, he achieved this uh, by painting oil on glass, creating motion in a kind of limited, limitless painting, shooting one similar frame frame for each stroke of the brush. As oil covers the layer underneath, he was able to use it again and again until the total layer had gotten so thick that he had to use a new paint. This way he ended up using five paints to realize the 10 minutes of the film, all of which today are at the Deutsche Film Museum in Frankfurt. One could say that Fischinger showed the progress of that painting frame by frame. He worked on this film for about eight months roughly 10 hours a day. It didn't only turn into his longest, but also his most work demanding opus. Let's have a look. Thank <laughs> you. 
In this film, uh, Feshinger obviously did not try to sync the sound to the images, but he just rather than went the other way and uh, trying to recreate the atmosphere and the mood of the music piece in visuals. Um, he was very happy about this, and he, full of pride, screened the film, the curator of the Guggenheim Museum, as the Guggenheim Museum had uh, uh, subsidized his last three films, and the curator was the Baroness Hilla von Riebe. But she hated the film and called it tech, uh, Fischinger's Awful Little Spaghettis, and even refused to pay for the lab cost. And that was the end of Fischinger's last ever film for the Guggenheim, and the last one he ever did. America was not that friendly to him. <clears throat> Pretty similar to uh, Fischinger was Len Lai, uh, a New Zealander, uh, who early on in the 20s had uh, moved to London, created some really interesting uh, um, uh, commercials by way of uh, animation, and then moved on to the United States. And his most acclaimed film, let's have a look, is very, very different again. Thank <laughs> you. 
This film uh, was made originally in 1958, and in it, uh, Lyre reduces the medium to its most basic elements, uh, as you have seen, light and, uh, and uh, yeah, what is it? Yeah, motion, motion and lights. Okay, uh, he was scratching designs on black film, as you've seen, and he used to, with this uh, uh, variety of scribers, ranging from dental tools to an ancient Native American arrowhead, and synchronized the images to traditional African music. The film won second prize in the International Experimental Film Competition, which was just by s such heavy names as uh, Man Ray, Norman McLaren, and Alexander Alexeyev, and others at the 1958 World Fair in Brussels. But Eli kept uh, returning to this film, and uh, in 1979, 20 years later, 21 years later, he uh, condensed the film by dropping one minute of a, a running time, and uh, it became even stronger an impact. And actually, that was the version you've we have just seen. It's the four-minute version from 1979. Stan Brackett, whom I mentioned to, uh, before, one of the real big, big gurus of the American experimental film, called the final version an almost unbelievably immense masterpiece, a brief epic. But music can have other importance as well, and I'm going to show you now an excerpt uh, I don't dare show the, 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 the whole film. Normally, I don't like to show excerpts, but this is too long, 22 minutes. We don't have the time for it. It's uh, by Standish Lauder from 1971. Lauder, by that time, was a professor in, uh, in filmmaking. And this is just a corridor. The whole film is just a corridor between his room at the university and his classroom. And uh, yeah, we can do a lot of things there. And we have, we look, look in there.
that much for the uh, excerpt from Corridor, Stanislaw, 1971. Um, the music to this, the soundtrack, is by Terry Riley, A Rainbow and Curved Air. Terry Riley, together with uh, Philip Glass, uh, Steve Reich, and uh, Lamont Young, he is the core of what was called then minimal music. It still exists to this day. So the question is, how do you transfer uh, transform minimal music in a minimal film. I mean, it, it's not the idea to be minimal again. Uh, it has to be an attractive film. And the way he used it is really, I mean, it was minimal in the sense that it's only the corridor between his uh, uh, office and his classroom. And if we look carefully, we can see the difference because to one there are three steps leading up the other side. It's straight uh, on the same level. Uh, but when I remember when I first saw this film in uh, Oberhausen on the Oberhausen Festival in 1971, the critics were really raving about this film. And some said, oh, that is a, that is a symbolic sexual intercourse. Because forward, backwards, and yeah, you see you, you have these colors that looks like uh, uh, like sperm and whatever, whereas others said, no, this is a poor man's LSD, because uh, it's cut, as you've seen here in the end, it's so short cuts that uh, the intercutting of the light, the interfering with the light, uh, in what's called technically a flicker, leads to uh, uh, seeing color on the retina. And not very strong, but we see some, it's completely black and white, but we see some colors, so that's, yeah, poor man's LSD. A lot of the people did that in those days. <clears throat> but if we really come to the point of where, where film, where music is transformed into uh, uh, visuals, we encounter a problem. Let's uh, look at this one. It's a, uh, song by Bob Dylan, which was never released officially by him, but still this very, very expensive uh, um, video clip is made by him. Well, this is a, a fantastic uh, music video for the Dylan uh, aficionados out there. It's a uh, from the O oh Mercy sessions in 1989. And it was uh, nominated for best video at the Grammy Awards. The problem is if we look at it, who did the video? What is the video all about? I mean, it's it's very complex and it's, it's very interesting, uh, intriguing. And uh, if you compare it to a lot of the, or most of the other music videos, but just the group or the, 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 the singer and the, or whoever is just there standing doing his songs and moving a little bit. But we are so used to the notion of a director that puts his artistic stamp on a film. Yeah, we have the director, and Mayat Elvis did it. But the question is, wasn't it in this case the cinematography by Dain, uh, Daniel Pearl or actually the editing by Hugh Chalona? What is it? What what makes the film? What what is so artistic about it? Or is it just the intrusion of, of special effects? It's not really special effects. It's just the the, the letters and and whatever. I mean, it's it's hardly it's hard to say, and hard to tell. And uh, this is the new way we're coming with films, and it's not the same as before. So uh, the second last film I want to show you is uh, by one of my former students. It's called Bamboo by uh, Lucas Dittebrand from 1907. Uh, and it's single frame shooting as well, but it's actually done with the stills camera because towards the end of my active uh, days at the university, the students were all shooting with stills cameras because they gave higher resolution and were uh, much more affordable uh, than, than the uh, film cameras in those days. At least at the university, on the university level. Thank <laughs> you. 
So, yeah, uh, this was very minimal indeed. Lucas used just 400 green straws, a bit of water, and a bit of milk in the end. But the really interesting thing is why the film is so impressive, the, the short piece, is that he worked together, uh, he had a collaboration with a musician, and the musician was really able, capable of transforming Lucas' thoughts into music, and Lucas was capable uh, of transforming the ideas of the musician into a soundtrack. And uh, at this point, a good advice to students, work with musicians for your films. It's not only easy uh, if you, uh, uh, then you won't run into problems with the copyright later on, but also you will find musicians among your fellow students or somewhere else who are eager and willing to really compose something, an original score or whatever for your film. Well, just to finish, I would like to finish on a, on a much lighter note, uh, uh, a film by Matt Harding, Where the Hell is Matt? from 2008. Uh, actually, Matt made five clips uh, following the same pattern. Uh, rather bad dancer in front of landmarks around the world. He did these uh, five films between 2005 and 2014. There was a controversy if this was really filmed on location or if it was uh, a green screen. And this has been settled, definitely. He has been going there. Uh, thanks to uh, sponsorship from Stride, Stride Gum, which is a subsidiary of Cadbury. So yeah, if you find, find someone who's willing to pay you a lot of money, you can do films uh, like this as well.